all to Lord Zico's thorough newspaper analysis for 19 September 2023. Now, starting with the today's agenda, covering the editorial session, why PayPal has moved on Rebel Delhi High Court against its categorization as a payment system operator, which we have taken from the Indian Express. Then in the special edition of the TNA, we will be discussing about how human reservation bill kept lapsing over the years. And following which we'll be discussing the news update, which includes the national news, international news, important days, awards and sports. And lastly, we'll be discussing about some legal news update coming from the Honorable Supreme Court and the High Court. Now, why a woman reservation bill kept lapsing over the years? As per the media reports, the Union Cabinet yesterday cleared the Women Reservation Bill in a key meeting chaired by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The checkered legislative history of the Women Reservation Bill began 27 years ago when the HD Devi Gowda led government introduced it in Parliament in September 1996. Now let us have a let us have a look at the history of the bill. The first attempt, which was done by the United Front government, the Constitution 81st Amendment Bill 1996 which was insertion of new articles 330A and 332A was first introduced in the Lok Sabha on September 12, 1996 by Ramakant D. Khalab, the then Minister of State for Law in the United Front Government. The bill was referred to a joint committee. The panel proposed seven major suggestions and felt that the bill's wording of not less than one third with regard to reservation for women was vague and liable to be interpreted differently. They suggested the following measures. It is to be substituted as nearly as maybe one third so as to leave no scope for ambiguity. There should be reservation of seats for women in Rajya Sabha. The Legislative Council and benefit of reservation to OBCs should be considered at the appropriate time. The provisions regarding reservation of seats for women in Lok Sabha and state assemblies should be for 15 years from the date of commencement of the Act, with them being reviewed after that period to decide whether the reservation should continue or not. And one of the members nominated from the Anglo-Indian community shall be women by rotation. The second attempt led by the NDA government between 1998 and 2004, the BJP-led NDA government headed by Atal Bihari Vajpayee tried to get the bill passed multiple times. The first time 1998, as the then law minister tried to introduce the bill, the Rashtriya Janta Dal and the Samajwadi Party MPs registered their protest. The bill was listed for introduction the next day as well, but the, but the speaker deferred as a consensus was not possible. The bill was finally introduced on December 23rd, 1998, despite protests from the members of the SP-led Rashtriya Loktantra Morcha, Bahujan Samaj Party and the Muslim League. There were differences among the NDA allies over it as well. The bill, however, lapsed as the House was dissolved after the fall of the Vajpayee government in April 1999. Now, coming up to the third uh, phase of the history of the Women Reservation Bill, after Vajpayee formed the NDA government again, the bill was reintroduced on December 23rd, 1999 by then Law Minister, Minister Ram, uh, Mr. Ram Jait Milani. But members of the SP, BSP and RJD again protested. The Vajpayee government tried to push the bill three times afterwards in 2000, 2002 and 2003 but could not succeed. In July 2003, the then speaker Manohar Joshi conveyed on an all-party meeting to try and build a consensus but was unsuccessful. The bill subsequently lapsed. Now, UP government pushes the bill. In 2008, the UPA government finally introduced the bill on May 6, 2008. Before Law Minister H.R. Bharadwaj could rise, SP MP Abu Azmi rushed towards him to snatch the copy of the bill. Even as then women and 
child development minister renuka choudhury along with some other congress mps tried to block him physically and cordon off bharatwaj another sp mp hurled pieces of torn paper into the well of the house finally bill was introduced and referred to the parliamentary standing committee on personal public grievances law and justice the bill sought to reserve as nearly as may be one third of the lok sabha and legislative assembly for women and provide one third the number of seats reserved for the scs and sts in the lok sabha and state assemblies for women of those categories the committee recommended that the bill be passed in its present form without any delay two members of the 31 member panel dissented like the mukherjee panel it also suggested that the government should consider the demand for reservation within reservation for obc women and some minorities at an appropriate time now march 9 2010 red letter day after pending for long 14 years the bill saw a breakthrough in 2010 On March 9, 2010, after two-day discussion, the Rajya Sabha passed the bill by over a two-third majority with support from BJP and the left. The previous day, the Rajya Sabha had witnessed chaotic scenes. Two MPs climbed onto the then chairman tables, punted the microphone, tore up a copy of the bill, and hurled it at the chairman. On the day the bill was passed. all seven of them were suspended for unruly conduct and were physically evicted by marshals while the bsp walked out the trinamool congress did not participate in the voting the upa government however did not show the political will to get the bill passed in the lok sabha despite the bjp and the left supporting it In 2011, Speaker Meera Kumar convened an all-party meeting to break the deadlock, but it was in vain. That's all for the Women Reservation Bill, which kept lasting over the years. Now, starting with the today's editorial session, why PayPal has moved the Honorable Delhi High Court against its categorization. Now, let us understand the context of this particular editorial. Now, online payment. online payment platform paypal has moved the delhi high court against a single judge order which ruled that it was which ruled that it was a payment system operator under the prevention of money laundering act and is obliged to comply with reporting entity obligations under the law as a result The division bench of the Honorable High Court is hearing PayPal's challenge to the July twenty fourth order of a single bench of justice, Mr. Yashwant Verma. The single judge bench had noted that all the elements of the transaction connected with a payment being affected between two parties would appear to fall within the scope of the expression "payment system" under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. and the technology on which the platform of paypal rest enable the transfer of money between the parties at different ends honorable justice verma however quashed the monetary penalty imposed by financial intelligence unit india on paypal for failing to comply with the reporting obligations as placed under the prevention of money laundering maintenance of record rules now what the challenge before the single judge Pay, paypal moved the high court against the december order of financial intelligence unit india holding it to be a reporting entity under the prevention of money laundering act while also imposing monetary penalties on it for failing to comply with the reporting obligations under the prevention of money laundering maintenance of record rules now Financial Intelligence Unit India is a central national agency responsible for receiving, processing, analyzing, and dismantling information relating to suspect financial transaction. It is an independent body reporting directly to Economic Intelligence Council, headed by the Finance Minister. Now, in this whole context, what was PayPal's argument? PayPal had argued that it is not a payment system operator. as defined under the pmla that is prevention of money laundering act 
and is not engaged in rendering services relating to clearing payment of provision of settlement between a payer and a beneficiary. PayPal said that it only provides a technological interface enabling export-related transaction that may be undertaken by an Indian exporter and an overseas buyer. In the chain of transaction, at no stage is PayPal engaged in the actual handling of funds. Now, PayPal additionally relied on the RBI stand in another matter where the central government, and uh, sorry, central bank had said in an affidavit that PayPal is not a reporting entity which operates a payment system under Payment and Settlement System Act. The reliance was made arguing that the definition of payment system under PMLA and PSS Act are identical. Now, let us understand what is the difference between the payment system and the payment system operator. A payment system is a system which enables payment between a payer and a beneficiary and includes system which enables credit debit card operations, money transfer operations or similar operations. In other words, it is a mode by which two persons can transact monetarily. Now, PMLA defines payment system operator as a person which includes an individual, a company or a firm etc who operates a payment system and such person includes his overseas principal, an individual or a company which resides or is registered outside India and owes, manages directly or indirectly activities of the payment system in India. Now, what is a reporting entity? A reporting entity under the PMLA means a banking company, financial institution, intermediary, or a person carrying on a designated business or profession. The definition is broad as it encompasses not just companies, but a person. A person under PMLA is an inclusive definition which includes an individual, a firm, a company, and an agency, among others. Now, to understand this whole concept, we need to understand what are the reporting entity obligations. The PMLA lays down certain obligations of banking companies, financial institutions, and intermediaries. Some of them include maintaining a record of all the transactions, keeping them confidential, and verifying the identity of their clients under the Aadhaar card. The reporting entities are also mandated to maintain information and enhance due diligence for a period of five years. Now, we need to understand how does a PayPal work. Explaining its business model before the single judge, PayPal said that its work begins when a foreign entity contacts an Indian merchant for the purchase of goods. Now, explaining its business model before the single judge, PayPal said it, it works begin when a foreign entity contacts an Indian merchant for the purchase of goods. Once they confirm the purchase, the foreign entity proceed to make a payment to the Indian merchant who on board by the PayPal India provides the PayPal India link checkout page to the foreign entity. The foreign entity then clicks on the link checkout page and makes payment by debit, credit card, online banking to the Indian merchant. The money is debited from the instrument of a foreign entity and collected in the authorized dealer Nostro collection account with the authorized dealer bank. The said authorized dealer bank then transfer the same to the authorized dealer bank export collection account, which is in Indian rupees held in India with the authorized dealer bank, who then transfers the same to the Indian merchant. In other words, PayPal at no stage it handles the fund which move between the Indian exporter and the foreign buyer and the money is directly handled and systematically routed by the AD banks at the end of each transaction. PayPal therefore said that the authorized dealer bank both overseas as well as in India are reporting entities under the PMLA and since PayPal only provides a link which is subsequently utilized for the effective transfer of funds it can't be termed as reporting entity under PMLA. An authorized dealer 
bank is a financial institution authorized by RBI to deal in foreign exchange transaction. Such bank helps in carrying out export and import transaction. Now, this was about the PayPal. Now, what did FIU uh, India argue? The FIU argued before a single judge that merely because PayPal is not recognized as overs covered by the PSS Act provision, that would not mean that it is not to be treated as payment system operator under the Act. The body has said that the framers of the, for, of the money laundering law choose to independently define payment system and payment system operator under PMLA rather than merely adopting the provision of the PSS Act. Now, this indicates the legislative intent to confer a different and a distinct meaning upon the phrase payment system and that the PMLA has a dual character as it contains both penal and regulatory provisions. FIU said that PayPal principally discharges a role of facilitating payment transaction and thus its technological platform would fall within the embed of payment system under PMLA. Now, what was the single judge verdict said? The single judge first said that the PSS Act is concerned with payment aggregators and intermediaries who are engaged in the direct handling of funds received from customers and the various aspects connected therewith, including the settlement and netting of such fund. The High Court said that this act does not appear to control the technological platforms and facilitators who are not directly concerned with handling of fund, but may be intermediary in the movement of fund. Thus, the High Court has rejected PayPal's argument that just because it was not recognized as payment system operator under the PSS Act, it can't be one under the PMLA as well. In other words, High Court ruled that the scope of the definition is wider. Observing that PMLA is a special statute dealing with money laundering as opposed to the PSS Act, the High Court concluded that even if PayPal is not engaged in handling of funds at any stage of transaction, it would still be recognized as a payment system operator under the PMLA Act. So this was all about the editorial session, a brief understanding of the petitioner and the respondent argument. Now, starting with the national news of the day, India becomes 13th country in world that can issue OMI, OIML certificates. India has become the 13th internationally accepted authority for issuing International Organization of Legal Metrology certificates. Domestic manufacturers of weighing and measuring equipment like BP meters, oximeters, and cloth sales can now get the instrument tested in India itself before selling them in the international market. And OIML patent approval certificate is mandatory to sell a weight or measure in the international market, which the Department of Consumer Affairs can now issue. Domestic manufacturers can now export their weighting and measuring instrument worldwide without incurring additional testing fees, resulting in significant cost savings. Twelve other countries, including Australia, Switzerland, China, the Kreis Republic, Germany, Denmark, France, and the UK are authorized to issue this certificates. Now, the next national news coming. KSSL, that is Kalyani Strategic System Limited, receives prestigious award for export performance of defense and aerospace products. It's a fully owned subsidiary of Bharat Fog Limited, announced that it can be honored with a prestigious award in the category of export performance of defense and aerospace product at the North Tech Sym Symposium 2023 held in Jammu. The award was handed over to the company by Honorable Defense Minister Shri Rajnath Singh. The award is a reflection of Kalyani Strategic System Limited's contribution to the defense and aerospace industry and its dedication to promoting self-reliance in the sector. Now, the government launches Skill India Digital. Union Minister of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship Dharmendra Pradhan launched Skill India Digital a digital platform aimed at synergizing and transforming the skills, 
education, employment and entrepreneurship landscape of India. SID, that is Skill India Digital, is a digital public infrastructure for skilling, education, employment and entrepreneurship ecosystem of India. It will also act as a comprehensive information gateway for all government skilling and entrepreneurship initiatives. The platform has used technology to offer secure, tamper-proof and verifiable solutions. Digitally verified credentials help users to present their qualifications, experiences and certifications in the digital format that carries an inherent layer of authenticity. With the introduction of this particular Skill India Digital, digital CVs via personalized QR code, potential employers or partners can access the portfolio of the candidate with a simple scan. It will showcase their skill, qualification, experiences and achievements. Now, KCR launches nine new government medical colleges in Telangana, aims for one in each district. Telangana Chief Minister Mr. K. Chandrasekhar Rao has inaugurated nine new government medical colleges across the state. With this, the number of government medical colleges in Telangana has gone up to 26 from 5 in 2014 when the state was carved out of Andhra Pradesh. Telangana Health Minister Mr. T. Harish Rao claimed that the inauguration of nine new government medical colleges in a single day was the first in the history of the medical education field in the country. KCR underlined that the number of medical seats has increased from 2,850 to 8,516 now. He said another eight new medical government colleges will be opened next year. Industrial Bank launches virtual commercial card for cross-border payments. Ports Industrial Bank has announced the launch of virtual commercial card, a credit card that will redefine cross-border transaction for corporate and travel agent, the company said in a press release. Launched as a virtual commercial credit card, it would help corporates and the travel industry who make numerous bookings in multiple foreign currencies. With this virtual commercial card, this users can generate virtual cards or credentials in foreign dominated, foreign denominated currencies as well, safeguarding the parent card number, ensuring more security for transaction. Each virtual card can be fully customized with transaction specific limits and even the expiry dates can be defined to ensure a secure and a seamless payment experience. Now, India jumps seven places in Digital Quality of Life Index Survey. India is ranked 52nd out of 121 countries in Digital Quality of Life Index Survey. The survey has been carried out by cybersecurity firm. The annual survey by the Netherlands-based firm has ranked 121 countries on five factors, which are internet quality, the internet affordability, e-infrastructure, e-government, and e-security. India was ranked 59th last year. In terms of e-infrastructure, India is placed at 91st position. The survey has placed Singapore and Saudi Arabia in top positions when average internet speed is considered. The report notes that mobile internet speed in the country have improved by staggering 297%. This has been attributed to widespread 5G rollout. When it comes to fixed broadband speeds, the modest increase of 16% has been seen. Now, cricketer Harman Preet Kaur among three Indians on Time 100 next 2023 list. Three Indians have made it to the Time Magazine 2023 list of 100 emerging leaders who are shaping the world. Cricketer Harman Preet Kaur, tuberculosis survivor Nandita Venkateshan and architect Vinu Daniel has featured on the list. Vinu Daniel is the third Indian on the list. He is the founder of Walmarks, a studio that uses mud and waste as a main components for construction. The Time 100 next list also features an Indian origin scientist, Nabarun Das Gupta. He helped launch a program that cleared bottlenecks stopping to avoid overdose reversing drug 
naloxone from getting to the front lines. Former SBI chief Rajneesh Kumar appointed chairman of MasterCard India. MasterCard, a leading credit card company, announced the appointment of Rajneesh Kumar, former chairman of the State Bank of India, as the chairman of the MasterCard India. In this role, Kumar will provide guidance of MasterCard South Asia executive leadership team led by Gautam Agarwal, division president for South Asia and country corporate officer, India, as they navigate the domestic payment landscape as stated in MasterCard official announcement. MasterCard is a company that offers a wide range of payment transaction processing and related services, including travel-related payments and booking operates in 2010 countries worldwide. Now, it's worth noting that MasterCard faced regulatory challenges from RBI in 2021, resulting in a ban on issuing debit and credit card to new domestic customers due to compliance issues related to storage of payment system data. However, this ban was lifted in June 2022. A very interesting news. Now, next news coming up. Kiran George clinches Indonesian master title 2023 in badminton. Indian badminton player Kiran George clinched the men's single title at the Indonesia's Master 2023 in Medin, North Sumatra. The Indian women's double pair of Tanisha Krasto and Ashwini Ponappa, seeded 7th, were ousted in the semi-final after losing to the top-seeded pair Lani Triya Mayasari and Ripka Sugyatro of Indonesia. Now, Uttarakhand's Global Investor Summit curtain raiser held in New Delhi. Uttarakhand's Chief Minister Shri Pushkar Singh Dhami, who was speaking at a curtain raiser program at a hotel in New Delhi, regarding the Global Business Summit to be held in Uttarakhand in December, said the Uttarakhand is a fast emerging as a young state where there were where there are vast opportunities for industries. So it's an exam-based question, Global Investment Summit curtain raiser held in New Delhi, which is from the Uttarakhand. Now, let us coming up the few days, which is International Democracy Day. The International Day of Democracy, celebrated on September 15 each year, is a global governance that underscores the importance of democracy as a fundamental human right and a cornerstone of good governance and peace. It is established in 2007 by a resolution passed by United Nations General Assembly. This day serves as a reminder of the essential role that democracy plays in shaping societies worldwide. What is the theme? The theme for this year is empowering the next generation. Now, let us tone down to the history of this particular day to understand it better. The roots of the International Day of Democracy can be traced back to the United Universal Declaration of on Democracy adopted on September 15, 1997 by the Inter-Parliamentary Union and International Organization of National Parliament. Subsequently, Qatar led go effort to promote the establishment of the International Day of Democracy. Finally, on November 8, the UNGM adopted a resolution titled Support by Union United Nations System of Efforts of Government to Promote and Consolidate New and Restored Democracies. Now, World Ozone Day is observed annually on September 16. The theme this year for World Ozone Day is Montreal Protocol, fixing the ozone layer and reducing the climate change. Examination-based question, it is celebrated on September 16th. Now, International Red Panda Day is celebrated annually to raise awareness about the endangered red panda species. It is observed on the third Saturday of every September, which this year fell on September 16th. The International Red Panda Day was initially established by Red Panda Network in the year 2010 when there was a noticeable decline in the population of the species. After the establishment of the day, it was then celebrated on September 18, 2010. Now, this is the history of how much red panda are there in particular states and the regions. Please have a look on to it. Now, the legal updates coming from Honorable Orissa High Court 
notaries cannot register marriage or issue marriage certificate which was held in the case of Parth Sarathi Das versus State of Odisha. The Odisha High Court has reiterated that notaries cannot register marriage as they are not authorized to do so under the Notaries Act 1952. The division bench of Justice Sangam Kumar Sahu and Justice Sibo Sankar Mishra, while asking them to abstain from issuing marriage certificate observed, due to such extra legal and sub suffrage arrangement by the notaries, parties are made to believe that they are legally married when in fact their marriage do not have even the slightest of legal sanity. Now, in suit for passing off, plaintiff required to prove figures of sale, advertisement expenses to establish goodwill coming from the Honorable Supreme Court in case of Brihan Karan Sugar Syndicate Private Limited versus Yashwant Rao Mohite Krishna Sahakari Sakar Karkhana. The Supreme Court has reiterated that in the suit of passing off for establishing goodwill of the product, it is necessary for the plaintiff to prove not only the figures of sale of the product, but also the expenditure incurred on promotion and advertisement of the product. The top court observed that though the statement of sales, advertisement and sale promotion expenses certified by the chartered accountant were exhibited by the plaintiff in the suit before the trial court, the chartered accountant was not examined to prove the statement. The court said that Though the statements may constitute a material for examining whether the prima facie case was made out against the opposite party by the plaintiff, however, at the time at the, of the final hearing of the suit, the figures must be proved in a manner known to law. Now, another legal update coming from the Honorable Supreme Court. Registrar cannot exercise power of substantive review while cancelling society's registration. Supreme Court has upheld the decision of the Honorable Kerala High Court where it has held that the Registrar of Society can only cancel registration granted to a society under the West Bengal Registration Act 1961 by exercising a power of procedural review. The bench of justices Anirudh Kos and Sudhan Shudhulia thus upheld the, upheld the order passed by the High Court remanding the matter to the registrar for the fresh decision on the application for cancellation of registration filed by the opposite party. Now, this was all about the today's news update and the legal news. Hope you like the session. Keep watching. Thank you so much.